had to occur first before the resurrection of the dead would occur. And it was always a general resurrection. Everybody would come out of the graves, you know, together. And so if they had a hallucination, and let me concede that people who are bereaved and, and uh, in experiencing mourning and loss might have, say, hallucinations of the, the, the dead one. Maybe Mary Magdalene or somebody, say, hallucinated Jesus. Given hallucinations as projections of the mind don't contain anything that's not already in the mind. They are projections of the contents of, of the mind. So given their Jewish expectations and frame of mind, if they were to hallucinate Jesus, they would see visions of Jesus in glory, in Abraham's bosom, where the righteous dead went to depart, to be with God. And at most, that would have led to the belief that Jesus had been assumed into heaven. He had been translated into heaven, which is a totally different category in Jewish thinking from resurrection from the dead. So I don't think that even if I concede that they hallucinated, which I'm, I'm not ready to concede, but even if they did, I don't think it would lead to this proclamation, he is risen from the dead. Have you read uh, Bishop uh, Shelby Spong's book, uh, Resurrection, Myth of Reality? I haven't read Spong because, frankly, I mean, I... You ought to debate him. Uh, I, I'd like to. I, I, I'd, I'd like to very much. But I, I think Spong is a popularizer oh, yeah. of more credible scholarly work, which I have read and, uh -huh. and tried to interact with. Now, on, on the, on the, no, let me, on let the me, hallucination... Let me, let me pursue a point, if All I right. may, uh, on that. Uh, the reason I raise Spong is this. Uh, couldn't there have been a process? Couldn't there have been an initial experience of a hallucination, an extremely real seeming experience in which, you know, several apostles, uh, you know, had a hypnagogic or a hypnopompic hallucination, which once again, psychologists tell us is extremely real, as real as I'm seeing you guys right now, they say. Uh, and uh, when they had that experience, and then couldn't there have been a period of time in which, as Shelby Spawn says, they thought this over, they reflected on this experience of the, of, of, of the you know, resurrected Jesus or the resuscitated Jesus, whatever, that they had experienced in the hallucination. They reflected on this, they thought about this, they worked it out in the smithy of their souls, as Spawn says, mm -hmm. and eventually the best sense they could make of it is that Jesus was risen from the dead and that the new age, the apocalyptic age, which Jesus did preach, as far as we can tell, going by the earliest Markan accounts, Jesus did have apocalyptic content. The era was rife with apocalyptic content. Why then couldn't they yeah. see his resurrection as the first prefiguring the general resurrection? Once again, Dr. Craig, I simply did not see such a massive conceptual shift here yeah. that we couldn't have something like a paradigm shift. Paradigm shifts do occur. Yeah, and it's a cumulative case. I mean, what I'm offering here are, are three independent pieces of evidence which I think right. cumulatively have force. And with respect to the, the paradigm shift, it just seems to me that given the Jewish frame of thought and beliefs about the afterlife, that if they were to hallucinate Jesus, the best explanation of what a Jew would believe in having such an experience would not be he has risen from the dead. That, was a, that was an un-Jewish way of thinking. It, it's in hindsight that we look back and, and say, oh, they might have believed that. But that's not the way I think a first century Jew would have interpreted it. I mean, it would have involved spiritualizing the kingdom of God oh. rather than thinking of it as, you know, physically coming. And as I said, I'm not prepared to grant that these were hallucinations because you, you can't show any hallucination that fits the model of the resurrection appearances in all respects. I mean, you might pick one hallucination that fits one aspect. Here's another hallucination that fits another aspect. But there isn't anything that fits all of these in terms of the diversity, the range of people involved, and, and so forth. I mean, for example, James, Jesus' younger brother, we have good reason to believe he was not a believer in Jesus during his lifetime. And yet we know also we have good testimony that he was a firm believer and leader of the New Testament church afterwards. Now, how do you explain the fact of James' conversion from being an unbeliever to being prepared to die? And he did die, Josephus tells us. James died for his belief that his older brother was the Lord. Now, what would cause you or me to believe your brother is the Lord? You know, apart from what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, then he appeared to James. And you can't write that off as hallucinatory because James was an unbeliever. And similarly, Paul, you know, was an unbeliever. So it's this diversity that I think makes the hallucination hypothesis less credible. Can we come to some claims? You had talked about okay. the idea of extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Yes, indeed. The question I've got is what 
what that extraordinary evidence be in the first century? You didn't have video cameras, you didn't have scientific tests. So what would that look like if you were looking for extraordinary evidence? What would, gosh, you know, that makes it especially difficult, of course, right? It makes it especially difficult in, in, in uh, justifying any miraculous claims from, uh, from those days. And I think that's not a problem for me in any sense at all. That's a problem for the people who are claiming the miracles. The paucity of evidence, you know. Uh, if there had been a video camera there at the, at the uh, do door of the tomb, you know, and we could see the angel coming down, rolling aside the, uh, the, the big stone, that sort of thing. Uh, well, I would say probably, first of all, it was made in a Walt Disney studio. That would be my first hypothesis, uh, you know, that uh, Steven Spielberg had something to do with it, you know. Gospel of Matthew is incredibly Spielbergian. I mean, you ought to make a movie of it. Okay. But, uh, you know, that's the, uh, that would be my first hypothesis. But, you know, you raise a legitimate issue, but, you know, I'd simply have to point out that's not a problem for me. That's a problem for anybody that wants to claim a miracle. T.H. Huxley, in a marvelous classic essay written in 1890-something, uh, he said, look, there are all sorts of sources that we have from ancient times that include eyewitnesses saying, I was there when Charlemagne cured the leper, okay? If we believed all those stories, we would be incredibly credulous people. Remember that wonderful thing in Shakespeare? Uh, I love the quote from Shakespeare from uh, Macbeth. Remember the thing in Shakespeare and Julius Caesar in which he's talking about, uh, you know, that uh, against the capital I saw a lion walking and I saw a common slave, you know him well by sight, uh, that he was emanating fire, this sort of thing. Well, Again, these sorts of stories came from sober, secular, pagan, uh, whatever, historians of ancient times. If we believed all of those stories, once again, uh, I've got some Dr. Parsons patent miracle cure that I would like to save you. I just need to go, some, go out and bottle it up, you know, for a few minutes and bring it back into you, and I would like to tell you that. We would be incredibly credulous to believe all this. Well, it, these cases have to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Of you course. can't dismiss the resurrection narratives on the basis that some other spurious miracle stories have occurred. You have to assess each one on its own merits. And what I fear from your response is that this watchword, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, is really just an excuse for an a priori rejection of the miraculous because you, you weren't, or you didn't give any sort of evidence that would satisfy you with respect to one of these extraordinary claims. It made it sound like to me you were saying that nothing would convince you, oh, no matter no, what. No, all sorts of things would convince me. Well, with respect to the resurrection, though, I mean, you you even said if there was a video camera, you'd say it was a fake stone that was rolled away. You know, I mean, what what sort of what be the, sort would be the more reasonable hypothesis under the but, circumstances? Well, but see, that's what I fear. It is. It's uh -huh. just an it's just an a priori rejection of the miraculous here. You're you're not. There isn't any kind of literary testimony, historical testimony that mm -hmm. could convince you. Once, once again, it's uh, what, uh, common sense. Let me appeal to court cases, okay? In court, on what basis do we believe certain testimony, okay? Well, we believe testimony often on the basis of how likely or unlikely we think it is that somebody is telling the truth on the basis of all sorts of surrounding circumstances. Now, in court case, generally speaking, uh, there are no claims to supernatural action. There are no claims to anything occurring which was physically impossible or against the laws of nature, however one wants to phrase it, you know, that sort of thing. Yet we still judge guilt or innocence, send people to the uh, to, to, to execution or not, on the basis of what we consider to be likely or unlikely on the, on, on, the, on the given circumstances, that sort of thing. So once again, these extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence in no way implies a bias against the supernatural. It's well, simply, it's sim it, it's simply uh, an application of a rule which we use in our daily lives. But, but you're saying that these, when you say extraordinary, really what you're saying is no amount of evidence would co convince me of these extraordinary claims. Sure it would. If uh, tomorrow morning, immediately after breakfast, suddenly there was an earthquake, you know, and a silvery light shone in the sky and the leaves dropped from the trees, and I dashed outside and there, towering over us like a hundred Everest, was this giant figure with lightning playing around his Michelangeloid face, and he pointed down and saying, Be assured, Keith M. Parsons, that I do in fact exist and I'm sick of your logic chopping. Uh, Dr. Craig, I would join you in the pew of the church, in the you, front pew of the church the next Sunday. Uh, you, uh, so, uh, you know. Be going to the question and answer period. We're going to go to the question and answer period, so we'll be going you, to the microphone you, as we wind this think, down. You don't think that you would have said, boy, I was having a hallucination. <laughs> <laughs>